crusader forces that the Umanis then uh, uh, start to dominate the region. And by 1812, we find that uh, the Sultan uh, Sayyid Said uh, comes into the area and he stops fighting, which is going on between Mombasa and Lamu. And then by 1840, he subdues the whole Swahili coast. And the Umanis then move their capital from Oman, from Muscat, they move it then down into Zanzibar. So the island of Zanzibar off the coast of what is now uh, known as Tanzania becomes the capital of the Omani Empire. Huge plantations were developed and slave labor was being used to grow the spices and the sugar and the different uh, products which were being sold all throughout the Muslim world. This is a sad period for Swahili history because it is during that period that slavery comes into the forefront. And hundreds and thousands of people were taken from the interior and were sold in slave markets in Zanzibar and then also in other parts uh, of, the, of the Muslim world. It is important to understand, number one, that um, slavery was not the beginning of Swahili culture. That Swahili culture really was developed from an ancient trade that was going on between the people of the north and the people of the East African coastline, those who were moving all around the Indian Ocean. Swahili culture was a beautiful blending of, of African uh, languages, African culture, and Arab culture, and Persian culture. But what happened during the Romani period was, in a sense, uh, another form of imperialism. And so the problem we are facing today uh, looking at history is that usually when people speak about East Africa they speak about the Romanis and slavery as though this is the only contribution that East Africa has made to history. The reality is this was a short period of time and um, the first generation of Romanis who came into this region were actually freedom fighters and they helped the local people to liberate themselves. To add to this some new interesting information is now coming into the arena. And we want to open up these gems, this hidden uh, history, and bring it out to the world. It is well known, um, as we have mentioned earlier, that the Arabs from the first century AD um, penetrated deep into the East African coastline. What is not so well known is that they actually made it deep into the south, and they reached below Tanzania, and they were trading, of course, um, for, with using uh, iron and glassware, and they were getting ivory and rhinoceros horns. Al Masrudi actually wrote about uh, merchants coming from southern Arabia who sailed down to what is now known as Cape Delgado province in northern Mozambique. And so they had reached deep uh, into the south. What we recognize now is that, number one, what we know as Mo Mo Mozambique during the Islamic period um, came from the colony of Musa ibn Baig. So Musa ibn Baig becomes Mozambique. Yusuf Ali becomes Sofala. And Sofala um, develops into one of the important cities on the East African coastline deep south. It is also known as Sofala the Golden. By 511 A.D., a traveler named Antonio Fernandez traveled along a well-worn trade route from Sofala to what is now known as Zimbabwe. And he trades with and interacts with King Chitaka of Zimbabwe. The indigenous people within uh, that region had developed a very high culture. And what is coming out now is that um, the, the, the Arabs were actually writing about this. And when they spoke about the indigenous people, they gave a general name. They also used Zenj uh, as a name. But the actual names which are coming to the surface are Vatsonga, Varhonga, Wakarenga, Waremba, and different groupings that are part of South Africa today. One of the groups, especially Waremba, 
they are described as people of a ruddy complexion who spoke a language similar to the Moors and they wore linen and cotton and they all wore caps uh, on their heads. And so what develops here in this part of the world is um, a, a culture that is based upon the movement uh, coming from the coastline into the interior, the great Zimbabwe, and this is where gold was being mined. And so the southern African gold uh, was coming out in large quantities. And between the 14th to the 16th century, trade centers were set up all along between Mozambique and the Zimbabwe plateau. So that we see within the 14th to the 16th century, the great Zimbabwe is built. A massive structure uh, there in Africa. And some people said it was built by non-Africans. This is not the truth. It was African people who built it. But it was as a result of the trade going on uh, from the coast into the interior. What we also recognize is that the regions being passed through by the merchants who are leaving Sofala and then going into the great Zimbabwe include what is now known as Limpopo province. Also, Mpumalanga province. And these two provinces are important regions within South Africa. South Africa now has come to the forefront as one of the leading powers in the southern hemisphere. On the African continent, South Africa sets the trends um, for economic development, for political unity of the people. And uh, Muslims had entered into South Africa from an early time and had influenced the people in that region. We are now also finding, because of recent studies and interaction with the people uh, in that region, that there are tribes that we find with Arabic names. So we find tribes with the name, for instance, Salim. We find the word Basha being used as a tribal name uh, in the south. And when uh, our historians and, and uh, our, our contacts went into the, the regions and talked to the people. They knew that they had Arabic names. They related uh, to their history as being not the same as people who were uh, uh, unaffected you know, by the, 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 the Arab uh, Swahili culture of the coast. But their history was lost. What is important coming out of this discussion and understanding is that Islam was not and is not a new religion in southern Africa. But Muslims have played an important role in the economy of that region for the past few centuries. Muslims also have clear roots in South Africa and in the southern region long before the coming of the Dutch colonial people and then the British uh, forces who set up the present day South Africa, uh, Rhodesia uh, and the countries that we know of the south. This is important for national identity. This is important for the connection between the people of South Africa and the Muslim world. That Islam was actually part of the culture. You take it a step further and you find within the culture of the people, Waremba, and down into the Zulu and the Sutu, you find Tawheed, the belief in one God. You find that uh, many of the concepts that, that Muslims use were actually practiced by the people in the southern region. We find that people in South Africa, it is a common practice amongst the people that when a person dies, that they bury uh, that person uh, in cloth, in white cloth. They bury that person straight into the earth. There is a natural separation between the males and the females in social gatherings, in the household, and within the society itself. Also, many of the people of the South have a great respect for those who cover their bodies and are, are very much concerned with the virginity of their daughters. And many of the aspects within Islamic culture are, are found in the people of the South. This then confirms to us the presence of Islam from an early age and the fact that Muslims are not a foreign force coming into the region. But Muslims had something to give uh, to East Africa. And this example is an example 
that, that, that should be taken as a lesson to the world. The example of the Swahilis. These are people now who come in contact with each other. There are African people living, living in the eastern part of Africa. They are coming into contact with uh, the Arabs who are moving along the coastline. Instead of living in conflict, they intermarry with each other. They share their vocabularies. They share their food. They share their cultures. So those aspects of East African culture that were important, the medicines and how to live within that region, was taken in by the Arab Muslims who came to the coastline. Those aspects of high culture where uh, Muslims had made great progress in science and technology and also in different uh, household goods. And so there you see the Arabic language coming in and Arabic loan words uh, developing within Swahili culture until a blending comes about and um, the Swahilis are able to relate to their African uh, 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 parents, African predecessors, and their Arab predecessors. And that is a beautiful lesson to the world today, that we are all part of one human family, and that we need to learn to share with each other, to blend our cultures, and to look at other races and ethnic groups, not in a negative way, but take the best from other people and integrate come together within a world culture that can reach the heights of civilization. This is the story of the Swahilis. This is the story of how this culture even reached present-day South Africa, another gem of wisdom of the untold stories of world history. I leave you with this thought. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.